The FNAF movie is the greatest movie ever. Done by absolutely no one. Look, I like the movie. Just the fact that it exists is good enough for me. But this is the movie industry. Participation trophies don't turn profits or change the minds of wannabe critics with a Rotten Tomato account. Look, it's got everything you'd want. The Freddy cast, Mike, Vanessa, and an Afton that isn't British. Now, am I the type of FNAF fan that praised this piece of cinematic mastery as the greatest thing in the movie industry since the invention of colored film? No, but am I gonna unapologetically bash this passion project for the objective and obvious flaws that hide in plain sight? Surprisingly, no. But am I the CEO of hating? Yes. <clears throat> All right, class, I prepared this little PowerPoint presentation for you on why the FNAF movie is just the absolute worst. A movie that didn't quite live up to expectations. FNAF VHS good, FNAF bad. Thank you for coming to my TED talk. Yeah, I could make some valid arguments on why the FNAF movie isn't as good as we FNAF fans may think, but I feel like it's a little too late to dig into the movie, especially since I'm one controversial whoa, opinion whoa, away from whoa, being put on a hit list. But if you want genuine criticism that isn't in the form of a one hour and 31 minute video essay and it won't hurt your little feelings, I highly recommend the intro to the Kill Counts video on the movie. What James says pretty much hits it on the head. As a film, I found it kind of mid. Also, MatPat is there. The only flaw I care to speak on is the only one I truly think holds this movie back from being Oscar worthy. The lack of the king of FNAF. Not DJ Sturr, of course, because I doubt they even consider him, but Markiplier was missing because he was too busy filming Iron Lung, which I think is legitimately insane because think of the thousands of games he's had in his catalog. Iron Lung just so happened to be the only one that's impressed him enough to make an entire movie about. Couldn't be your favorite indie developer. Without Mark, the quality of the movie drastically dips. One could only wonder what the movie would have looked like if he were there. Maybe there was some film that had not only Mark, but two other goats as well. Wait, you better not title card me. June 7th, 2011. A YouTube channel was created by the name of Random Encounters, made by good friends Andrew John Pinkerton, Nathan Morse, and Peter Cervanesan. Are you seriously playing Subway Surfers while I'm doing the video essay thing? Alright, alright, I get it, I get it. Attention span. Random Encounters has always been a music channel. The majority of their videos are just musicals and songs of what games were popular at the time. As far as they let us know, their content has been high quality from the start. Not in the sense they were cinematic masterpieces or industry-led music videos with millions of dollars of production, but the effort they put in for something during their time would have been viewed as stupid is nothing short of impressive. 12 years ago, you'd be ridiculed for taking this little video sharing site seriously. The interest in this type of thing was really sparse. And aside from some breakout hits, true outlier in their little niche of video game fan songs, the views reflected the true longevity of their content at the time. No, seriously, if I posted a video that got this many views and went on a fall off streak that rivaled modern day MCU, i just fucking kill my- But through this drought, this seemingly unimpressive catalog of videos, they have some uploads that really popped off. For every video that was under 10k, there was another up ahead that 10 x that view count. It's also important to mention that the videos that didn't pop off were the ones that weren't musicals. While there were some outliers, the majority of their vlogs, let's play, and bonus content didn't really gather the attention that a fully fledged music video would, so they knew early on what worked and what didn't. And boy, did music videos work. More often than not, music videos and viral seem to go together for random encounters. It's actually rare to see something music related on their channel that didn't get at least a million views. They are so successful that a million views would be considered underperforming. As if you sort by popular, their top three videos ever posted have triple digits in the millions. It takes a whole 33 videos to get back to single digit views. And the millions. Honestly, insane. But their first video to cross 10 million was their infamous Resident Evil music video. It had Markiplier in it too, but you want to know what else had Markiplier in it? <clears throat> I have a confession to make. I never watched the FNAF musical. You what? Look, 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 I actually found out about it through an MMD. Vampire of the Snow, just spelled wrong, made not one, but two viral recreations of Random Encounters FNAF musical. The one I happened to click on during my unsupervised internet years was the less popular of the two, but let me tell you, I know bangers, I know bangers. Night 2 is a banger. Just you and me again, or three, and nothing else between me and this door. Other than that, I didn't really dip my toes into the rest of the series. I know Matt Pat showed up later, and I didn't realize this was Nate once the battle, top three FNAF song artists, no contest, but that's all I knew. The FNAF musical isn't lore accurate, I think it's better that way. This may be a controversial opinion, but sometimes fan content is more interesting than canon. They just have more creative takes on already existing things we've seen. 
period. It's the same reason FNAF VHS are so popular. For the most part, FNAF VHS are just interpretations of the mainline games, albeit told from a different lens. That means even if the content at hand is literally just a retelling of what already is, it's definitely more refreshing than Afton coming back for the 50th time. Yeah, that's definitely an exaggeration, but the reason Baddington is so popular, besides the movie quality work he puts in, is because we watch him with the expectation of seeing what he'd do with things we've already seen. It's fun seeing how the canon of the series is tackled with a different creative vision, whether that be for better or for worse. The same goes for random encounters. I was thoroughly surprised by how many games they cleverly incorporated without a single time skip and it all just works. I mean, the narrative they constructed was entertaining while still not taking itself too seriously. Yes, FNAF lore police, we can all agree that this is not FNAF, but it's FNAF enough to where you don't really care all that much. If you can be in love with the idea of Scott Cawthon being personified as a guy with a telephone head, you can get past the fact that the animatronics are glorified sock puppets. That's the greatest assault that has to be taken when watching these things. You can't expect the lore in these things to make sense when the lore in the game doesn't even make sense whoa, 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 either. Whoa, hey. Like yeah, Mark kills a man in cold blood and the police just let him go. I mean, but at least you can make the excuse that the police are incredibly incompetent in not only the FNAF universe, but in real life, so. The musical is separated into nights. Each night represents a different song till it just started representing episodes. So, enough yapping, let's get active. Yes, that is in fact the Chuck E. Cheese they put a logo over. They didn't even like perspective warp it right. Fun fact, this little intro sequence was added after the series was over. It was only after they made the supercut they added this as a bonus. We're introduced to our main character, Markiplier. They literally just call him Mark. It's not Mike, not Jeremy, just Mark. Iron Lung must have bankrupted him because he's forced to pick up a 9 to 5. The ad revenue isn't hitting like it used to, especially back then because how did random encounters afford to make this set? It's generally impressive the amount of effort they put into it, like they even made the doors work. I know damn well they didn't have some Raid Shadows Legends money just funding this project. Speaking of Raid Shadow Legends, actually I'm still not cool enough to have sponsors. My emails are open by the way, you know, Opera GX, NordVPN, uh, the... The, the, the titty cup company? As Mark peruses the cameras, we get our first look at the animatronics. In this iteration of the FNAF gang, they look a bit different, don't they? I mean, I, I can't put my finger on it, but uh, oh wait, they're freaking Whoa, sock puppets. Yeah. It's a creative decision that sets the series apart in a good way. They could have done some blender magic and put the animatronics in, or dead ass fully engineered robots like Dr. Creepypasta, but I feel this was way better for the series in the wrong line. <laughs> Wrong long, <laughs> long run. <laughs> Look at them. Instead of being murderous animatronics, they're just cute and cuddly sock puppets who wouldn't hurt a fly. Oh my goodness. Mark is a bit of a tweaker. I'm talking about the tree speaking Vietnamese type of tweak. The animatronics can hear him crashing out from the stage, so they go to check on him, genuinely worried about his well-being. They even send him a little note. They conclude that Mark's not all right, so Chica goes to fetch Foxy so he can get involved. I like how Foxy's just unintelligible grunting. Yes, that is in fact how he speaks and will continue to speak for the rest of the series. The doors are locked, but Foxy knows a spot and ends up breaking into the office through the vent, but Mark in his panic desperation forged a mango mask to blend in. And what follows is... Hey, I made a video about that. Also, get used to the song. So of course, understandably, Mark stops Foxy from committing sexual assault. He locks him away in the air vent and seals him inside. Did you catch that? Go on, tell me. Oh my god, we got a Yapatron. Yes, Night 1 is three games in one. It has Mangle, the Puppet, the Vents, and even the Phantoms. But focusing on the Puppet, Old Charlie comes out to give Mark a visit and gives him the most aggressive idle animation ever. Wait, if both doors were locked and Mark just sealed the vent, how did the Puppet get in? Anyways, Mark's power management sucks. Because with both doors closed, his power quickly shuts off. No, actually, that doesn't happen. They don't jump scare him. They jump love him. Not like that. Purple guy. He said it. He said it. AJ. I'm AJ. Are you here to kill me? No, I'm here for the morning shift. Morning shift? 
It's 6 a.m. I, I lived. I lived. <laughs> yep. Yep, you did. By the way, how are you getting so many hours? You're scheduled four more nights this week. What? And that concludes night one. It's a great introduction to an even greater FNAF series. Like seriously, it amazes me the amount of effort random encounters put into this. Like I'm never building a full FNAF set for a FNAF video. It's not that serious. If the series had just ended here, it would be fine because it stands well on its own. But luckily we aren't on the dark timeline because night two is where the bangers begin. Mark clocks into a shift with a different mindset. He's playing FNAF with mods. He loaded up Black Ops 3 and downloaded the FNAF custom zombies map because he snuck his loadout into the establishment. I'm on with more than a light. And I'm surviving five nights. This is where the songs actually start being good, in my opinion. Don't, don't get me wrong, night one was catchy, but I think night one serves more as an introduction to the album, and night two is where the album starts. And if any of you happen to not only be in the FNAF niche, but also the Anthony Fantano niche, first of all, why? And second of all, night one is like my dark, beautiful, twisted fantasy, and night two is like kids see ghosts. This whole song is just fuck around and find out. He's trying to end the FNAF series at one, but the only thing he manages to end is the janitor. Cause I'm surviving five nights. You're not foxy. Evidently, there's not much that goes on in this night. It plays more like a bonus piece to night one than its own episode. There's rarely any interactions with the FNAF crew besides them being understandably scared shitless by the FNAF YouTuber with a gun. In fact, this could be seen more as a single by Markiplier, and I'm not complaining. Just you and me, a gun or three, and nothing else between me and this door. After literally killing a man, Mark gets arrested. Or does he? You don't get it. They're in the trash. <laughs> children that were stuffed in the animal suits. Oh, They're trying to kill everybody. We are introduced to our newest main lead, Nate Wants the Battle. In the episodic version of the series, we just get right into it, but in both Night 2 and 3, the director's cut had context before it. It had lore. In the original release, it just gets into the musical, skipping the details like Nate being a previous employee at Fast Bears. Well, not entirely. You do pick it up from the musical, but in the director's cut, we have an entirely separate introduction. We learn that Nate needs to pay rent, and that $120 check is not going to cover that, but it will make some good parlay money. So he clocks into his shift, reminiscing about the old days of malfunctioning animatronics and below minimum wage. Meanwhile, the Freddy gang receives an Amazon package they didn't order. Despite Bonnie persisting, they open it. The rest of the gang convinces him to send it back to the Amazon warehouse, but when he returns... He gets struck from behind by some mysterious figure. Freddy and Chica find out Bonnie had just vanished, so they split up to go find him. And what follows next is them getting taken out one by one. Bonnie gets tied up, Chica gets stuffed in the puppet's box, and we don't even get to see what happens to Foxy. Take a moment to imagine they weren't sock puppets. Imagine the 6-2 spring trap single-handedly folding almost the entirety of the Freddy cast. Getting laid out as unsuspecting children is one thing, but then getting low diff by a rotting corpse rafting is crazy. Good thing this door can be locked. That's weird. Usually that only happens when- ah! no. Now it's Nate's turn to get folded. No, please don't kill me! They don't don't work. Work. There's no way out of this. I'll save you! You gotta be kidding me. Shut your it's not looking good for Team Freddy right now. But don't worry, Charlie comes in to clutch the 1v1 and okay, never mind. The way to defeat this behemoth, Mr. No Dips, your favorite character, Springtrap, is by how every go gets washed. Plot armor. You really can't go one night without popping out of something, can you? He says he hid in there when Springtrap tried to stuff him in a Freddy Fazbear suit. The implications of that are actually insane. Let's go back to imagining they aren't sock puppets. Springtrap jumped Foxy and attempted to stuff this 6-7 animatronic into another animatronic. Springtrap is making him relive trauma. That's foul. Speaking of horrible, what do we do about this? The puppet was the only one who could defend us. Now well, with him gone, there's no one to stop Springtrap. Well, I know a guy. I don't understand. Why don't they just dispose of him now? He's downed and just hit the Apex Legends finisher on him. Send him back to the lobby. Due to a mandated donut run, Markiplier escapes the police car solely because they forgot to lock the door. Oh, the chief's gonna have our badges for this one. I won't tell if you don't. 
He rushes home, changing his creative character real quick, and simply just goes to sleep. Meanwhile, Nate and the Faz Gang pull up to his location because Bonnie apparently just knows where he lives. Also, again, the director's cut of the musical had added context. There was an entire scene before this with extended banter between Nate and the Freddy cast, and a whole other important interaction with Purple Guy. Night 4 and 5 is where the added context is needed, because if you were watching them episodically, you miss out on a lot of important details that are missed in the original uploads. It doesn't change the plot, but it adds more substance to the narrative. For example, in the director's cut, we get a shot of Markiplier tweaking, which adds to his paranoia when the FNAF animatronics show up in his house. Speaking of that, scared that Springtrap will wake up and start crashing out, Nate uses the Balloon Boy robot he apparently had the entire time that lives under his desk to lure and confuse Springtrap while Freddy and the gang go talk to Mark. This is easier said than done as Mark immediately starts scrambling hands. So now it's this awkward scramble between Freddy's and Mark's house. At Freddy's, Nate is trying his best to keep Springtrap distracted. He's playing dead by daylight with him, something a lot of people wish would happen in real life. Back in Mark's house, he's hiding away from the animatronics like this is FNAF 4. Remember when I said they incorporated more than one FNAF game in this? Well, there you go. Like FNAF 4, Foxy comes out of the closet and the rest of the animatronics use this as an opportunity to get the jump with Mark. They shortly corner him, trying to convince him to join their cause. But Mark ain't having none of that. He pulls out the knife, and I know Mark is crazy enough to have a switch on it. Back with Springtrap, remember when we were talking about Apex finishers? Well, yeah, Springtrap knows what's up, because he finally catches up to Balloon Boy and delivers the meanest left-right goodnight a sock puppet has ever done. Nate's face says it all. Now, after selling the Dead by Daylight map to Springtrap, Nate eventually comes inside to stop Freddy from being posted on lively. He successfully convinces Mark to join his cause. And even if I was willing to go back to Freddy Fazbear's, which I'm not, what do I get out of this? Psychological damage? Uh, a horrible, gruesome death? 25 years of life with a cellmate named Buffalo Frickin' Bill! I don't know. Well, I don't know. Proving you didn't lie to the police would be pretty cool. Fine. Hold up, because he's still a wanted criminal. I don't care that the police just agreed to let him go. He brought firearms into the establishment, shot an innocent man, and then proceeded to escape arrest. Mark's gonna be like, hello everybody, I have proof that I wasn't lying by the way. And then the cops are gonna be like, that's crazy, remember when you shot a man? Shut that off or I will kill you! And now we reach the final episode. Night 5. It starts off with the ball rolling, but of course, of course, the director's cut. Shut that off or I will kill you! We actually start with the gang chilling at Nate's crib. All the animatronics sleep in a dog pile for some reason. Wait, th they sleep? Nate and Mark yap about honestly nothing. The guy. He was just sweeping the floor. I actually heard that guy's in stable condition. Really? Put three rounds in his chest. Yeah, I don't know how he survived that either. I think this was their way of watering down Mark's crying, but you can clearly see he has no remorse over it. Here we get an insight on their plan, their magnum opus. You got a plan? Survive till 6 a.m. They actually don't have a plan, because if they did, it wouldn't make sense. Because in reality, this bit was added after the fact, and the real plan was made way later on. So therefore, if they came up with a plan now, it wouldn't make sense for them to suddenly get hit with the Men in Black Neuralizer and come up with another one in the office. This is one of the rare cases where the extra scene just doesn't matter. Markiplier brushed up on his lore because he realizes that Springtrap is made of spring locks and a little bit of moisture and... <laughs> So does that mean Afton isn't inside Springtrap? Because if he was, then the spring locks would have already been spring decades ago. What are you spring locking? He's already cooked. Lore semantics aside, they plan to achieve this with the fire extinguisher, but the one in the office is gone. So they send the animatronics on a fetch quest to go find the ones that are around the building. But none of them have any luck. Someone clearly has taken the fire extinguishers and their last bed is inside the kitchen, Chica and Queso's domain. I like how you can clearly tell this is someone's house. Like, like this isn't a set anymore. This is an actual kitchen. <laughs> Chica hits the, he's right behind me, isn't he? And has to turn this back into a dead by daylight lobby because she is running. She makes it to the office with the fire extinguisher where they hit Springtrap with this Looney Tunes ass device. You literally can do this in Power World. My god, it's so wise. Nate is about to blast Springtrap, but the fire extinguisher got a bit too excited. Well, that didn't go as planned. Imagine that gave him brain damage. That's a fire extinguisher. He's probably off camera laid out like this. Purple guy! He said the thing! You were behind Springtrap all along? Oh, he was just supposed to be scary, but he gets a little carried away. Oh, so then what was the point of all of this? Wait. How are you getting so many hours? 
You're scheduled four more nights this week. He's just doing this because he wants more hours. Honestly, his motivation is up there with Thanos. S tier villain. Purple guy realizes that his entire plan was useless as for one, Mark's a wanted criminal and Nate just doesn't even want to work here. So pretty much this entire conversation boils down to, you got it little bro. Almost on an utterly anticlimactic note, the series is resolved. They put aside their grievances on the account of Purple guy's weak motivation and we get, we, Gun to your head, name five FNAF books. Man, I don't know. This is my restaurant! <laughs> I'm sorry, Chica, but Freddy's not getting up after that one. First spring trap, then Matt. I, I just hang up the hat at that point. I'm not risking going 0 for 3. Our true villain is revealed to be the GOAT, Matt Pat, the famous host of. Matt Pat's true intentions was to put everyone in the room on a shirt, and unlike Purple Guy, he's not trolling. But Mark's got one last trick up his sleeve. So it's a battle of the goats, and even with his head cut off, Springtrap continues to strangle Matt Pat. This causes him to accidentally use the flamethrower and. Yep. That's how our go gets washed. While this is happening, the main gang scrapes up Freddy's unconscious body and leaves the establishment, causing the pizzeria to be left to burn. I mean, really, what did you expect? There is no final battle, no thrilling conclusion, just fire. What's left the phone guy's master plan is just ashes. All his actions will ever amount to is just a single page in the newspaper. After everything he's done, his story wasn't even big enough to be on the front page. That's a shame. Should have gone with the headline, Freddy Fazburns. That's horrible. Nobody should go right for them. Job without haunted animatronics or chainsaw maniacs? Sounds boring. Well, I hear Freddy's is opening a sister location if you want to transfer. Uh, I'm getting another call. Alright, I'll talk to you later. Yep, see ya. Bye bye! Hello? You thought that dollar store fire was gonna be enough to kill me? How? You must have forgotten what franchise we're in. Fire doesn't do anything. I got that flamethrower off of Timu! Listen here, when I get out of here, <laughs> it's gonna be over for you. When I catch you, Nathan, let's just say you'll be the next YouTuber to retire. But before that, I just have one question for you. <laughs> Name five FNAF books. Nobody read those shits. Yeah, that's it. Let me just, uh, slide this here. Night One works as an introduction to the musical. It does what it needs to do, setting up the characters and just the rules of this modified version of the FNAF world. But I would be lying to you if I said I remembered anything about the song. And I had to do the research for this video, so you know it's cooked. Still though, it's not bad. Just compared to the rest of the series, it's probably the only skip on the album. B tier. In all the other nights, there's a shit ton of things going on. So not only do you have the songs, you have the plots being worked into it, and many other filler scenes that distract from the musical being a musical. That's why Night 2 is different. We're not learning the ropes of the world, we're not worrying about Springtrap, yet, and there is a lot less going on. Therefore, it has a complete focus on what it is, a musical, S tier. Night 3 suffers from the same flaws as Night 1. It's a slow burn and at certain points it feels like a nothing sandwich, but a common strength between the two is they both eventually pick up, but Night 2 just does it better. The song is catchier and the beat switch from Springtrap attacks no diffs the entirety of Night 1. Also, what the fuck was I talking about seven years ago? A tier. Night 4. Look, I know bangers. Night 4 is really good. I did think it's the most creative episode. Nate and Mark work so well together as a singing duo and stepping outside the music, the episode in general is just fun. They didn't have to incorporate FNAF 4, but they did, and they did it well. Easy A tier. I get it, Night 5 is the finale and all, but the musical section could have done better without the narrative bogging it down. It's such a small section in the episode that it felt tacked on rather than being a musical and a musical series. Yet, despite that, I think the song is still pretty good. But what's more memorable to me was the ending because come on, 
It, it's MatPat. He didn't get any singing roles technically because he's Phone Guy and Phone Guy does sing in night one, but it's clearly a different voice actor. But I think his presence alone is what really makes this episode. Also, when the pizzeria is burning, you can faintly hear an instrumental of his very short verse from night one. Nice touch. S tier finale. And that's it. That's the last episode of the FNAF musical.